coming to you live from the Council for Scientific and Industrial Research, the CSIR, at the International Convention Center in Pretoria. Welcome. This is the eighth biennial CSIR conference, and it is being held under the theme Harnessing Research, Development, and Innovation for a, ro a Robust South African Economy. The conference brings together local and international scientific experts, academia and industry leaders, as well as members of the public to discuss how research development and innovation can be harnessed for a robust South African economy. The CSIR secured more than 100 speakers addressing over 1,800 audience members over two days. And for now, we're having a conversation on the commercialization of intellectual property in science, engineering, and technology. Africa is brimming with potential for new products and solutions originating from sound, science, and technology outputs. But between the potential and the commercial uptake lies what is often referred to as the valley of death. It is the place where innovation and um, commercial markets fail to meet. And this, of course, has a huge impact um, in the solutions required to solve for mankind, for the brilliant prototypes that could be coming out, and for revolutionized manufacturing. With me to have the conversation today is Dr. Tulani Lamini, Chief Executive Officer of the CSIR, and Dr. Eugene Lottering, Deputy CEO, Research and Innovation Support an advancement at the National Research Foundation. Starting off with you, Dr. Lottering, let's have a conversation around the scene that unfolds itself called the Valley of Death. How long is it? How deep is it? And what is the shortest way for us to find our way through it? Um, and, and how do we overcome it? It's essentially a market failure um, where university originating technologies cannot be successfully commercialized uh, for, very, for a variety of reasons. Uh, in the space we usually look at a scale from 1 to 10 about technology, 1 to 9 about technology readiness levels and at the university level they usually function between 1 and 4 and on the commercial scale on the private sector side they look at it at the latter side of the scale between 5 and 9 as it were and somewhere in the middle is this chasm uh, which is created by lack of skills, lack of funding, lack of knowledge of the marketplace, competitive elements, etc. Getting out of it is, is quite difficult because you have on the one side the university professor whose mission is to conduct research. Uh, it's usually research of their own origin, their own ideas. Uh, and on the other side is what the market needs and, and trying to merge what the market needs and what the professor originates at the university is not always aligned. Um, university professors generally do not have experience around commercialization or business knowledge for that matter. Um, so the chasm is usually trying to align <coughs> what originates at the university with the marketplace and the sets of skills that are required are vastly different. Thank you so much. Um, Dr. Lamini, is there then a strategy to try and solve um, for this? How does CSIR come into the picture and play its part? I think to an extent we do, um, but we're not always successful. I think we must, must accept that. Um, I think uh, Dr. Lottering spoke to some of the structural impediments that contribute towards this value of that, one of them being the availability of financial resources. I think we know this from experience, that to commercialize a piece of intellectual property is a fairly expensive endeavor. In fact, um, it costs a lot more, you know, to commercialize than to develop the, the intellectual property. Um, to give an example, you know, we, we are investing with a partner in Germany um, over close to 300 million to commercialize one piece of intellectual property. Now, if we are to look at commercialization opportunity for what sits within the IP portfolio in the National System of Innovation, you can imagine there's a significant amount that we need to invest in this area. In my view, I think that the, the, the investment profile in research, development, and innovation in our country is perhaps lopsided. 
in the sense that most of the financial resources go towards the early stages of technology development. I think what Dr. Lothering spoke to as TRLs level one to four. And not enough is going into five to nine. You know, if I look at, you know, what sits within an NSI in terms of what should fund the part of our portfolio that sits between five to nine is what we refer to as the technology innovation agency. Now, if you compare the budget of the technology innovation agency to the budget of the NRF, for instance, which yeah. focuses on the one to four, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a ten, it's an order of magnitude agree. difference. Agree. You know, hence we are struggling with this issue. You know, I would say the NRF budget maybe is about four billion or more. Four to five billion. Four to five billion. billion. And the tier budget is maybe 500 million. Mm. Okay. Now therein lies the problem. How do we turn this picture around to ensure that there is sufficient investment that goes into this part of our innovation portfolio that we so need, you know, to drive economic development, mm. to drive job creation, you know, within, within South Africa. So when you speak about the 1.5% target that we have as a country mm. in terms of growing our percentage of GDP that goes into R&D, in my view, mm. that additional 0.7, that we need to, 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 to add into the, into, the, into the investment pot needs to go into this area of TR levels five to six to ensure that we can drive more of the commercialization of, of our intellectual property. Mm -hmm. As a CSIR, um, I think we, we are doing a lot, but the scale is very limited, mm -hmm. you know, given the resources that we have available to us. We've got a number of internal programs um, that are looking at, you know, supporting the commercialization of the intellectual property coming out of our work, but it's at a very low scale. Um, there's work that we are doing now in terms of looking at strategies to improve the pace and the scale that we are able to commercialize intellectual property that maybe I can speak mm -hmm. to later. Mm -hmm. I'll come back to that as well and <coughs> talk about the stakeholders that are part of that process. But, but if I had to look at the tiers you refer to first, tiers one to four, and you're talking about the, 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 that the output that comes out of that as well, there's a huge challenge there. Is there, is there a way to solve for that um, that, 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 that can really speed, uh, improve the quality of what comes out? Because if the pipe is not bringing out a massive amount of um, market relevant, industry relevant, so, you know, solutions that are relevant for society, after that it's also difficult to really solve for what we don't necessarily need or what's not speaking commercial language or economic language for potential funders. So surely there are, there are opportunities there that you've identified, and, and how do we go about solving for the quality and the type of innovations that, that, that come out of the in institutions? Generally, an organization like the National Research Foundation would issue a call for proposals from scientists and engineers at universities. Those are usually curiosity-driven proposals. So they're not necessarily aligned with commercial outcomes. It might be a fantastic idea that a scientist has, which will generate basic knowledge that we might need down the line, but it's not necessarily at a point in time aligned to what the market needs. Mm -hmm. To align it, science and innovation, innovation department will come up with something like the decadal plan, which they have got now in place which says these are the sectors that we feel that you should be working in over the next 10 years. This is what we determine mm -hmm. we will need. But what is missing is alignment to say from a university perspective, start generating knowledge in this specific area mm -hmm. that in the end will end up in places like the CSR to then yeah. align and take forward. It's, it's very scattered. We're a small country, mm -hmm. so everybody can do whatever they want in that particular space. So we have to start uh, aligning our calls that we have as the NRF to what is going to be needed mm -hmm. later on by organizations like the CSR, by the Technology Innovation Agency in a funding, in a, in a funding from a funding perspective. And then I have to endorse what uh, Dr. Lamini is saying. The funding that is required is a critical element to take it forward. Mm -hmm. A major component of that chasm and failure within the chasm is a lack of funding. Mm -hmm. So who does have a vested interest um, in, in making sure that universities or, or that these knowledge bases are, are built up? Um, is, it, is it private sector? Is it government? 
who else can put the pressure or what is needed to really shift the mindset? I mean, if I look at UJ and I've been tracking the universities over the years in terms of which ones are evolving in their thinking, I find, for example, in my humble opinion, that UJ has really taken strides to align their output to what businesses actually need. But if I look at the university that I went to, the curriculum is still exactly the same as what it was five years, no, it's joking, 20 years ago it was <laughs> You weren't gonna buy that, you're gonna do a quick calculation and actually realize I'm lying. But, uh, yes, you're not gonna be convinced. It's exactly the same as 20 years ago. So, so who has a vested interest? Somebody's gotta say, that, that they, they want to you know, heavily influence, and even if there's a commercial incentive to it. How do we shift it in South Africa, holistically? Tough question. Well, the incentives are an important component of it, right? And the incentive is the funding that government brings to bear into the space. If you bring the, the, the funding into the space, we can align the scientists in the direction that the cattle plan is, is required. Without that, is we having a conversation with fellow scientists is what is required in the system, right? Uh, that is a critical component. You can't, for example, have the Department of Science and Innovation being the smallest department, yet the president stands up on a podium and says, science and innovation is what is going to lead to economic output, right? Yet it's got a nine billion grand budget, half of it comes to the NRF. What else is left to take things forward? Uh, so you've got to back the ideas that you want for economic development with the funding that's required in the system. Please. Maybe <laughs> just to add to that comment, and I want to, 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 to perhaps comment on the issue of quality that you raised and, and agree with, um, with Dr. Lottery. Um, in my view, I don't think that quality is a problem. I think that, in my, in my humble opinion, we have one of the best minds in the world in this country. I think we've got great scientists in the CSR and other parts you know, of the National System of Innovation. Um, I think we've got enough in terms of intellectual property coming out of the system. I think the issue is around unlocking that. You know, and, and to agree with Dr. Lothering's point, how do we create incentives that will entice, particularly the private sector, because we know the state is constrained, to come on board and invest in the commercialization of intellectual property coming out of the NSI. I mean, for instance, the, the 12J incentive scheme um, that I understand now has, been, has, has come to an end, discontinued. Mm -hmm. I think it was a very powerful tool, and it could be de redirected, you know, to, to encourage investment in the commercialization of, of technology-intensive, you know, uh, uh, intellectual property or uh, enterprises. I think that was a very powerful tool. I think it created between nine to 10,000 jobs and you know, there were a lot of enterprises created as a, as a result of that. I think we need more incentives of this nature, in my view, you know, to tap into this portfolio of intellectual property that we have. And, and to agree with the Dr. Luthering's point earlier about us not functioning as a system. You know, where you have universities on the one hand, you've got science councils in the middle, and then you've got industry. You know, which does the commercial, the commercial exploitation mm -hmm. of intellectual property. I think if we work as a system, an integrated system, I think we'll see a lot more in terms of the pull of IP coming out of universities and science councils that goes mm -hmm. into, into commercial enterprises. I think the work that we do as a CSIR, I mean, our mandate is very clear. We're expected to perform directed research and technological innovation. So our work is directed mm -hmm. towards, you know, creating an impact. You know, so one will expect that the work that we do is indeed informed by the needs of industry and the needs of society, but yet we still have this problem mm -hmm. that we don't see enough of our intellectual property that gets commercially exploited. Mm -hmm. I always make an argument that if you go to the private sector, because I used to be in the private sector, you don't have an innovation chasm in the private sector because there is very clear direction, I think, to, to the point made earlier about my fellow panelists, that if you have a clear strategy that says these are the areas that we wish to pursue, then you channel your energies towards that and this becomes a much more seamless, effortless exercise. And I think we have a country challenge, right? We, we need that vision. The vision you're talking about is a country vision. Yeah. What is the country vision? 
that is set by our president to say, here's where we are going. Here are the areas we're going to specialize in, and not pay lip service to it necessarily, where you say we have to lead in, in technology and innovation, but you're not actually backing that. So, so the conversations to be had is now on, on, um, on our fiscal policies. Which ones, you know, are, are we able to influence how we unlock um, policies that really redirect um, efforts towards innovation and, and the, the other sectors we need we, we need to focus on. You know, we, we talk about um, the 4IR. What are we doing, you know, ab about uh, the fourth industrial revolution? So how do we look at policy and do we have an opportunity to influence at a policy level? And then also, and, and I think secondly, we, when you look at the, the, that, that, that incentive, that tax incentive, you can't keep on taxing the same people. But again, how do we influence tax structures where people can get incentivized to put their money in the development of the country? Do you have sight of where the opportunities lie to change those fundamental levers? I, I, I think there's some progress. We still have to see the results of that. I think the, the, the white paper, the latest white paper on science and technology and innovation, as well as the decadal plan that the minister spoke to earlier today. Um, I think the intentions in those two documents are very clear that if, if we implement those uh, correctly, we'll, I think we'll make significant progress in terms of moving in the direction that we're talking about now. I think the creation of an interministerial committee um, on science, technology and innovation will ensure that we create this alignment and that, you know, now we have a conversation that happens between science and, and treasury, for instance, around these issues, which perhaps, you know, the platform didn't exist previously to have these kinds, you know, of, uh, of, of, of conversations. But I think we, we still have to see the outcomes of the intentions that sit, you know, in all of those documents. But I think in terms of thinking, we are beginning to think, in my view, correctly and, and, and I think if we implement what we wish to, to, to achieve, it will certainly move us in the right direction in terms of ensuring that these things are in place. We have to appreciate it does take time, right? Um, when, we, when, we, when we move around in South Africa, we know we have a lot of challenges. We don't often see that we are actually making progress, not as fast as we'd like to, uh, but the progress is being made. Dr. Lautring, low-hanging fruit perhaps. Um, that you feel if we tackled, um, we would be able to, you know, to see a little bit more leaps in, in progress and in technology? Import substitution. There's a massive opportunity around that. If, uh, for example, you look at in the health sector, um, the program, the ARV program in South Africa is the largest globally. It's the largest market for it, right? Um, the active pharmaceutical ingredient that goes into the tablet or the capsule that you take as a medicine in the end is the major, is the actual medicine in the tablet or the capsule. That constitutes 60 to 70 percent of the price of the product. We import those raw materials 100 percent into the country. We've been doing it since we started the ARV program, right? And, and it's costing us billions. Uh, of RAND going out of the country. There's technology that exists currently that can leapfrog us forward uh, for us to manufacture and get into the manufacturing space ourselves. It will create jobs. It will therefore reduce our trade balance going forward. There, there are several of these types of opportunities. A few decades back now, uh, 2000 and 2008, government had funded the creation of an electric vehicle. More or less at the same time Tesla was starting in the, in the US, there was a fully functioning car called the Jewel in South Africa, an electric vehicle. By the time the 2010 World Cup came around, we had an electric vehicle available, but there was no sufficient backing to take it forward at the next level, the next level of funding that we are especially talking about. So what's going to happen now? We're going to be importers of those Teslas coming into the country, and, and again, we, we, are, we are not becoming self-sufficient as a country. We're still going to be in the space where we are pointing technologies. Mm -hmm. So there, there, there are plenty of opportunities and expertise of, that is available to take these things forward. But there's the funding that is required in this gap to move things forward into the commercial space. And fundamentally, that's what we lack, right? We lack the... Um, 
I was, I was interviewing um, one, one market investor. We, we lack now the courage as a country to put money and bet on ourselves. Um, so so we, we have an Elon Musk who then, you know, who leaves the country. We do the electric vehicle. He leaves. He does it that side. And then we're buying it from him. We, we, we can't keep our own technology. We can't keep our own people. Mm. So there's something that needs to shift in the culture. You know, it's not just about the money. If, if our culture was to solve for ourselves, for our communities, yes. we would start to see. And, and that's what he was saying. He was saying, um, you know, back in the day, the, the gold, you know, the gold trade was betting. You bet on a piece of land. You did not know what was underneath it, mm. you know, and people went wild and they bet, bet on that. So, so would the Africa Free Trade Agreement, for example, be one of those, those signs, again, that shows that we are ready to produce for ourselves and to provide for ourselves as well as, you know, the continent at large? Because COVID has shown us that we, we, sh we should not always be reliant on ex external markets. So are there shifts to, to one, solve for industrialization? Because without that, we, we're dead in the water from a GDP point of view. Do you see signs of changes and, and the implementation of the agreements like the free trade agreement helping us to industrialize and to manufacture our own products? And not yet from my side. I don't know about you, but... <laughs> 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 I'd like to agree with you. As stated as it is. Yeah, I, I think to, I, I fully agree. I think, um, you know, we need to be able to do these things at scale you know, and, and at the right pace, of course. Uh, we're not seeing enough in terms of, in terms of that. But I fully agree that localization is, is, for, is for us uh, something that is an imperative. You know, we need to, especially in, in certain sectors or strategic sectors of the economy. You know, if you talk about health, you know, you gave an example of ARVs, but we even saw it now. We didn't even have the ability to produce masks or sanitizers, or you know, vaccines. I mean, something, some vaccines are much more sophisticated. You know, masks are much more simpler products to make. You know, ventilators. I mean, we got involved as a CSIR with the NRF and other players in the NSI to provide ventilators that helped us during COVID. But that should have been a wake-up call for us, you know, to say, let's maybe strategically look at which sectors of the economy <coughs> do we need to ensure that we create some level of strategic independence? I mean, today we're speaking about the shortage of microchips, semiconductor chips in the world. That's going to have an impact on us as well. You know, it's not just about availability of laptops, but there are you know, semiconductor chips that go into our power plants, into equipment that's used in hospitals. How do we ensure that as a country we create a level of strategic independence to, 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 to create a secret of supply? you know, in terms of those components. I think these are the kind of strategic conversations that we need to have as a country and then take a position and then invest in building the capabilities that will ensure that we secure our future in those areas. So, so there's two things to talk about and, and I think the, the private sector is a hard one. Maybe let's begin with a, a, a softer landing space, which is the partnership that's possible with private sector. You have your BLSAs, you have your BUSA, you have your industry bodies that really want to see this country prosper because they are de their businesses depend on it. What's the opportunity that lies with private sector? How are we unlocking and building stronger relations to solve for each other? There has to be a greater amount of that taking place, particularly from uh, a university perspective in trying to solve and address the problems that industry faces. Um, um, so joint ventures between industry and academia and working together towards particular solving particular problems. Joint ventures between the CSR and, and industry players in, in this regard. There's no shortage of of problems that need to be solved in terms of advancing our manufacturing sector to the level that it can compete with with, with global players and again reducing the imports that we that, that that we bring in it's a conversation that has to take place between universities and industry uh, and a reliance industry usually sees university as being far placed from what they actually require but you can steer universities in the direction of what you need to be particularly addressed. Uh, uh, but
particularly with the research and development program towards a, a specified outcome. It focuses the mind towards creating that particular solu uh, solution. I fully, fully agree with the comment. Fully agree with the comment. I think, in, in my view, industry is a is an absolutely critical component of this conversation. You know, um, because industry grows the economy. You know, government creates jobs, but it's a cost center. You know, economic growth comes from economic industrial activity. So industry is a very critical component of this conversation. Um, they are the users of the technologies that we develop, you know, and we benefit from that in the sense that they then invest in us to do more of what we need to do in terms of capability development and so on and so forth. So industry is an absolutely critical component of this. And I even venture to say that, you know, the minister spoke about the interministerial committee. I'd say we need a similar structure which has industry as a critical component of that discourse. Because you know we cannot have government talking to themselves. We need industry to say these are the priorities for us, you know, to grow this economy. Because as I said earlier, you know, economic growth comes from, you know, industrial activity. So they are def definitely an, an, an integral and a critical component of this conversation. And, and more and more, there's a lot of conversations with with industry that's bringing together. So we've been talking really at a macro scale. Bring it down a little bit to the, to the micro scale. Is there opportunity here for entrepreneurship? You know, because a big industry, yes, holds up the economy, but small industries where the jobs are going to come from is actually where the the greatest amount of employment. What are the opportunities from an entrepreneurial perspective, SMEs, in in, in also you know? coming in and, and, and growing the, that part of the engine, that probably makes even the biggest impact in the end. No, definitely, definitely. I can speak as a CS, on behalf of the CSIR that it's a matter that we've, we take quite seriously. You know, just in the past year, we've partnered with 99 small and medium enterprises in terms of you know, supporting and, 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 and engaging. Um, you know, if you look at our, um, our, our ability to license intellectual property over the past three years, this has grown by over 140% because we've been very deliberate about this. You know, given the significance, as you said, of small and medium enterprises in terms of contributing to our economic growth. So there are, there are ample opportunities uh, for that to happen. But the conversation that we started with around the innovation chasm, I think, hampers the pace and the scale at which we are able to do this. But definitely, uh, small and medium enterprises have a, a significant role to play. I think there are studies that have shown that in other parts of the world, um, small and medium enterprises create the most jobs in, in aggregated. And, and therefore, I think we need to, we need to ensure that you know, the, the policy environment you know, is conducive for the growth of the SMME sector you know, within South Africa. Mm. So do we feel hopeful? You know, I, I go to the feeling part now. How, how are we feeling? Um, because I think, we, as I said earlier, we can spend a lot of time seeing the challenges. You know, you, you sitting at the, at, at the forefront of these challenges. Are we feeling hopeful that as a country, we have the opportunity to do what we've done many times, to, be in this, to, to really show the world what the continent can do? As Dr. Lutring, how you, <laughs> your thoughts? As scientists, we usually accused of not being able to feel. <laughs> <laughs> yes, as you saw the word came out very slowly, you know, I was trying to find another one, there wasn't one. <laughs> very functional people, we, want, yeah, we like exactly. to solve the problems that are there. Um, um, and that optimism of trying to create solutions in the environment is what keeps us going. As, as, um, we want to get our country up into the space where it is competing at an international level. And, and we go into the science and engineering space because we like solving the challenge of problems that, that are there. So we see the problems and, and we see how we can put the solutions in place to drive economic activity in the country. We just need the funding and the backing to do it. <laughs> So feeling, yes, very optimistic. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and, and I think it's two things. It's finding the money yeah. and, and getting the money. You know, there's somebody's responsibility to put the money here. And there you're changing minds and hearts in the right exactly. direction. Exactly. Then there's the finding as well, is how do we, how do we self manage? But yes, um, doctor, to you, your thoughts. No, no, certainly. I think um, as a scientist and as a researcher, 
you don't have the, the option to be pessimistic. Mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> I've never, I still have to see a pessimistic researcher. <laughs> because you start off with an idea whether, you yeah. know, and you don't know if it's going to work or not. So if you're pessimistic, you probably just kill it before you even take off. So one has to remain positive. Um, and one remains positive. Um, look, we, we, we talk as if they, it's all you know, doom and gloom, but it's not so. There are many, many good things that we have going for our country. Um, and, and we understand the constraints in terms of the available resources. We understand, you know, the, the pool um, in terms of, you know, the immediate priorities that we need to deal with. But we also need to think about the future. Because the things we are talking about, you know, a, a lot of them are not about you know, solving problems today. You know, it's about solving problems for the future. Just to give an example, we were able to respond to the COVID-19 pandemic and support the state because of investments that were made 10, 20 years ago. If we didn't make those investments, we would not have built the capabilities that we had to then be able to put the solution that the country needed, you know, in 2020. So, you know, the game that we are in is a long-term game, and one remains, you know, very, very optimistic and positive. And I think the message is that, you know, as a country, we need to then balance, you know, our short-term needs with the long-term needs, you know, of the, of the country. But there's something looming in the horizon. There's, there's yes. something looming in the horizon that's going to be a huge challenge and a massive opportunity at the same time. Yes. That's climate change. What role can universities play? What role is, is science going to play? How are we going to ensure that we enable society to adapt, that we contribute to the reversal of the damage done uh, and I'm speaking to scientists, so I'm hoping we're all on the same page of believing. Yeah, we, we're on the page of believing that there is climate change looming. If we're not, it's going to throw me off completely. So I'm not prepared for that conversation. I'm completely prepared for the one that says we have, we are going to have environmental challenges that are going to affect the poorest of the poor in South Africa. So we've had a lot of challenges, but none like this. What are we doing for our readiness and what is required from your institutions as well as from the government for our readiness and our protection as society? Yes, we're on the same page. Um, uh, the, again, from a science and engineering perspective, it's a massive opportunity, the transition from what we're currently utilizing in our industries into a cleaner uh, energy base is a massive opportunity uh, as well because we have to, again, create the solar panels that are required to utilize sun as an energy source. We've got to, in that space alone, the efficiency of solar panels is around 22%. You, the struggle is to get it to a 30% or higher as an energy, energy base. That requires intensive research and engineering that has to be done over a period of time to move ourselves there. And it's a problem that's not just a South African problem, it's a global problem. So it's a competition amongst all over the world. And that innovation opportunity is the opportunity of creating economic growth as, as well. Well, but a couple of weeks ago, his previous company, Sassel, had an, held an, an energy summit in, uh, at their building looking at the same transition from where they are using coal to, to liquid um, and transitioning from that uh, into something much cleaner than that. But looking at it as an opportunity, it's an opportunity in the trillions of rands. Um, but you need to start now to get involved in that particular space. So as far as to realize the long-term plan that you was talking about, to realize the benefits in the future. Do you want to lean on to the question as well? No, I fully agree. fully agree with the comment by Dr. Lottering. Um, and I think that as a country, we're actually doing a lot, in my view, in this space. I think on the continent, we're most probably taking a lead in terms of dealing with issues of climate change. I see some of my colleagues who are very much involved in this field are also present here, and maybe they can also comment. So I think we are doing a lot in terms of, you know, firstly developing an understanding, you know, of the scale of the problem that we are faced with in terms of climate change and focusing in the region, you know, the southern oceans and, and so forth. So there's a lot of work being done in that regard. But also in terms of technology development, I think Dr. Lothering already spoke to, you know, some of the 
engineering intervention that you are putting in place, you know, in this regard. I think South Africa is a very unique opportunity in the sense that we have, you know, one of the best solar resources in the world, I think third best in the world, you know. And, and the issue is how do, how do we capitalize on that, you know. Currently we export coal to, to Asia, for instance. But that opportunity is going to, is going to dwindle over time. You know, as more and more countries move towards net zero and decarbonize. Now, our solar resource presents an opportunity for us to export energy in the form of molecules like hydrogen, methanol, and others, using you know, our sun as an energy source to generate those molecules. And that's the conversation that is taking place now. The minister spoke about uh, the hydrogen valley and you know, our hydrogen roadmap as a country. What we need to do now, in my view, is to try, is to start to move at the right pace in terms of getting those projects off the ground. I think we talk about a lot of these things, but we must be careful that the window of opportunity is going to close. So we need to start putting, you know, significant investments to see the realization of some of those projects so that we can start to become a, a world player, you know, in terms of this transition that we are seeing with regards to energy, for instance. And again, it goes back to the same problem, is that as much as we need to pick up our pace of innovation and research and design, the pipe for the money is squeezed. Mm -hmm. um, even the money allocated from first world countries that are supposed to help the impacted countries mm -hmm. out of which they have mined the coal yes. and utilized for their development, mm -hmm. um, and, and those countries have not been able to develop at the pace that allows them to, to, to be safe with the upcoming challenge. So, so the, the, the cry and, and the demand for money mm -hmm. to be released so that mm -hmm. this is actually done has mm -hmm. to be increased substantially. Exactly. What is our voice in this? How are we, how are we trying to ensure that we get the piece of that? Do we also have FDIs coming into the space? Do we have the institutions rallying and, and, mm -hmm. and, and making available funding um, to enable it? In my view, a number of these projects don't even need to be funded by the state. These, are, these can be purely run, you know, purely commercial projects. I think the state needs to ensure that the policy environment allows for this to happen. Because I think if we are dependent on the state to run, to invest in these projects, um, I think it will be very difficult, given all the other priorities. You know, I, I think we need to create an environment which will, which will be attractive for private investors to invest in these projects. I think the announcement around the increase in terms of solar power generation, for instance, and feeding into the grid, you know, has attracted a lot of private sector investment in terms of investing on in solar energy generation for the country, which of course benefits the, the country in the long term with regards to energy security. I think the same thing also needs to happen in terms of the hydrogen economy. I think the state needs to provide the correct policy environment, and then private sector must come in and play their part with regards to getting those projects off the ground. And this speaks to um, letting private sector play their part, which is probably policy and governance and probably the high level infrastructure mm -hmm. and letting private sector and institutions play the role of designing and innovating and creating exactly. that market space. But we're not there. We're not there, right? We still have a state that sort of wants to, to do everything. Yeah. And, and, but there's, a, there's an element of fear maybe. There's an element of fear of letting go and mm -hmm. trusting that people would take care of themselves. Um, so, so, Dr. Lottering, when it comes to the actual um, allowing of innovation, uh, oftentimes we need to understand the value of it. What is the value of getting involved, of, of getting uh, products licensed, of protecting IP, building IP? You know, what is the potential? Give us some really good examples that can inspire um, further, further, you know, need or want uh, for innovation and research to, to, to play its part effectively? I think government tends to make an investment as is its space uh, in the public good that can gen be generated out of universities. So part of that is developing and innovation, which is essentially an economic opportunity that somebody has to take forward. What is missing is usually 
the entrepreneurs who can take the technology that will be developed at universities, even at science councils, to move things forward. Entrepreneurship skills requires quite a bit of knowledge of the sector that you want to be involved in um, and the ability to access funding and resources that will take the thing forward. You, are, you, you have to lead it forward. It's a, the market is a competitive space, so you have to know what is going on in the market. You've got to know who your competitors are, you've got to know what you're pricing, you know how you're going to position yourself, you've got to know what your strategy is going to be to take that product forward. That's entrepreneur. You can't expect the university scientist to to run. It's very rare that you find university scientists that can be able to take the technology from the desk lab desk right into the space. But that once you can put an <coughs> ecosystem that can take technologies from university into the commercial space, it then creates the economic benefits that we all are looking for in driving. It creates an enterprise that can be established, you start employing people, and it can compete and grow. It's, it's, that is the full value proposition from the innovation space. Um, Elon Musk says, again, we go back to his example because he's on the news all the time, uh, um, the new goal is lithium, right? Mm -hmm. We've got plenty of lithium in the SADC region mm -hmm. ourselves, right? Uh, so we've got the means to, do, to put the batteries in place that are required for the vehicles of the future, for the cell phones that we use, et cetera, et cetera, right? But the technology development requires funding. In the early stage of the technology development, the private sector is not going to come in, an entrepreneur is not going to come in, because mm -hmm. nobody is going to fund it from a banking perspective or a private equity perspective. You've got to move the technology to a point where it's commercially ready, where the proof of concept has been validated. Mm -hmm. Then somebody takes it up and says, perhaps maybe we should operationalize this in the, and put it in the commercial space. It's about handing over the baton. Yes, it Literally, is. you've run the first race. It is a relay race. So how do you how do you hand over that baton? And I can imagine it should be easier now if we think about technology. If we think about how people communicate, there's so many platforms where people do, you know, research and they go out and they have a look. But it's also about where do we grow that type of an entrepreneur? You know, where do we find that type of an entrepreneur that can find these type of solutions? Um, you know, uh, get attached to them and 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 be willing to take that next journey to to commercial it and then you have the industrial development zones for example that could nurture something of that nature but these are huge opportunities I mean I didn't even realize how much opportunity there was in, in batteries for mm. example you know we we haven't even talked about that for solving for our energy mm. needs how do we lift the, the lid and, 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 and create that awareness you know I mean I feel embarrassed I found out only the other day how big a role batteries play if only we we knew how to put it into our homes and you know and utilize it why are we you know i don't want to use the word ignorant but we just don't know where and how do we lift the lid so that communicate so the content is easily available and hopefully finds the next person to hand the baton over to mm -hmm. now i think the issue of the public understanding of science is a, is an important issue um, and we have a role to play as a CSIR, and we do our part to the extent that we can, but I think there's, a, there's more that can be done, in my view, in that regard. I think if you talk about the issue of, of, um, of batteries, um, um, you know, there's a lot of work that is being done in the country around that. It's a sad story that can perhaps relate. You know, the, the chemistry that goes into most lithium-ion batteries, uh, it's called lithium-ion lithium phosphate chemistry was actually developed here at the CSIR, yes. you know, by a gentleman called Mike Thackeray. Mm. <laughs> Unfortunately, as a country, we did not benefit from that, you know, in terms of royalties coming out of the commercialization of that intellectual property. That program was stopped in the 90s for whatever reason, and we lost the capabilities that we had in terms of, you know, human resource and so forth. And, and I think if we had continued with that kind of research, I think South Africa will be perhaps, you know, amongst the leading countries in terms of lithium ion battery technologies. Mm. You know, it's a missed opportunity for the country. So it's a bit of a sad story. Mm -hmm. um, um, but but I think there's still an opportunity. I mean as Dr. Lothering indicated, you know, we, we hold the key ingredient. Mm -hmm. You know, we have the the, the the mineral that goes into lithium ion batteries and we can use that to our advantage. You know, as a country, as, as, exposed, as opposed to, 
just mining it and sending it to other parts of the world. You know, how do we, which is what we do now. You know, how do we create some kind of strategic position for ourselves? You know, given the fact that we've got access to this. Um, you know, so there are other other materials that go into this, like manganese, for instance. You know, we've got you know we've got the reserves here, but how do we position ourselves strategically? You know, so that we can get benefit. I think from the fact that we we we, we have you know access to to these key ingredients. But the point that you raise around public awareness, public understanding of science is an important issue. I don't think that you'll reach a point where you can say, I've done enough. You know, it's, it's an exercise that you have to continuously invest in, in terms of creating the understanding. This conference, for instance, is in, in a way trying to contribute towards the public understanding of science. You know, the fact that it's open to the general public, it's not just scientists speaking to themselves, you know, but we're trying to reach the broader, the broader public in terms of this kind of engagement. So, and, and I think, I think it, it, those sad stories need to teach us something. But I want to go back to my timeline of what's happened in South Africa and really pinpoint what was happening at that point that made us lose, you know. Uh, but we're trying not to have a political conversation. We're trying to have a science conversation. So I'll, I'll reserve that for, for an, a, another panel. Um, so, so we're at a point now where we're really having this conversation around harnessing research development and, and looking at, at innovation for South Africa. What is the one thing you wish your stakeholders to walk away with out of, out of having attended or having watched um, some of the conversations? Dr. Lache. I would, I would say to, to our government that back your people. Um, we can provide solutions to the problems at hand. There's a significant amount of funding required beyond the fundamental research that is by, being done now on the applied side towards leading towards the innovation. Back your people. Back your people. Back your people. <laughs> yeah, and back off if you're not backing your people. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to say who must back off, but. <laughs> And to you, Doctor, your closing comments. I, I think for me, perhaps what we, we hope to achieve out of this engagement is to demonstrate the, the level of excellence that this country has. Uh, we often you know, focus on the bad news, and there's a lot of bad news you know, stories that we can talk about. But there's also a lot of good things happening. I think we, we, we are in a fortunate position that you know we have got expertise, world-class expertise in terms of people and infrastructure. You know we are leading on the African continent, um, and maybe adding, sort of picking on the the point uh, by Dr. Lothering, we need to now ensure that we increase the scale at which we are able to do these good things that we are doing, because only then we will be able to see the kind of impact that we wish to make. Well, I hope that there's some very key conversations and people here um, and that this unlocks lots of opportunities to be able to, to, again, just marginally, continuously to shift that margin of efficiency and of achievement. You, you're so right. But I, I can tell you, you can go anywhere in the world. Everybody's focusing on how to solve their problems. That shouldn't be a discouraging exercise. This should be an inspiring exercise um, because we all are, you know, we're one global world now. We're trying to protect one world. So, so thank you so much for your time. Thank you for your insights. And I really hope that that uh, you achieve the best out of the, the conference. Thank you very thank much. You very thank much. you for the opportunity and for supporting Appreciate us. Thank you. thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. And that was the eighth biennial CSIR conference held under the theme Harnessing Research, Development and Innovation for a Robust South African Economy. My name is Anela Morrison. Thank you for listening. <laughs>